So, we are continuing today. Guess what? <laughs> Not the Gospel of Mark, uh, although we normally would on a big Sunday. But we are going to continue with this anthology series that we're exploring throughout the year that I've been calling Letters to a New Church. Uh, of course, those two, that new church is one in Thessalonica. Uh, there's a letter that's called 1 Thessalonians and another one that's a follow-up to that called 2 Thessalonians. Well, we are wrapping up this series, uh, Lord willing, Creek Don't Rise, next <laughs> Sunday. So I know some of you guys aren't going to be around because of the holiday. Uh, but it'll always hopefully be recorded somewhere out on the internet if you want to hear it. Uh, but we're near the end. We're near the end of this second part. The first one was called Anchored, and then the second part now has been called Steadfast, and uh, that's what we're getting into today. Now, one of the things <clears throat> that has become very clear as we're seeing this letter that is being written to this new church that was started quickly, leaders were gone fast, uh, they were kind of left out in the wild on their own, just the Lord just worked in their hearts, grew that small group, used them to be the church he wanted them to be. So much reminds me of, uh, of our church and most of the churches uh, that I am familiar with, uh, that the Lord is going to lead our church. He's going to guide us into what, we want, what he wants us to be. But something is very clear, and that is that throughout this process and looking at this, that the whole idea of church, just church itself, when you say church, uh, a lot of people, when I say church, something comes to their mind. Maybe it's a building, maybe it's a steeple, maybe it's some cross on a building or something. But most people think about church as a place you go to, right? We go to church. Well, in a sense, that is true. We gather as the church. But as we've gone through First Thessalonians here, we have seen that more than ever, it is just abundantly clear that church is someone you are. Right? It's not just where you go, it's who you are, it's who you're becoming, who we're becoming together as we gather to worship the Lord together. So following Jesus, as I've said before, is something that is meant to be done, not as a solo venture. Uh, you could, if there was nobody else around you, right? You're Richard Bird of the 1930s and you're down at the South Pole or whatever, <laughs> there's nobody else around, uh, then you are a single follower of Jesus. But that's not the way God wants it to be. He wants us to uh, serve Him and follow Him in community. Now, that is one of those words that is thrown around a lot in churches. And sometimes when people or churches talk about community, all they mean is getting some coffee before the service begins. That's not what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> but uh, we'll get more into that and have been as we've been going. So today we're, gonna, uh, we're going to see that there's some relationship gold. Gold nuggets, man. He throws these things in at the end of First Thessalonians. Relationship gold. And if these things are applied, they will absolutely change your life, I believe. And they'll definitely change your experience of what is called church. Uh, so we're going to jump into that uh, now. But first, let's pray again together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Thessalonians. Thank you for Paul and for Silas and for Timothy and the, live, uh, the lives they led and the, uh, the adventures that they were on and the way that they just left it all out on the field, Lord. This was not a game to them. This was not a weekly service, Lord. They were following you with all of their heart. There were things at stake. There were very real things happening in this early church, Lord, that had... Uh, all kinds of pressures, and if that wasn't real, if it wasn't the real deal, they were in trouble. And so I thank you for the testimony that you provided for us, and through the centuries have made available to us through your holy word uh, in this letter of First Thessalonians. Lord, we understand that it was to them. But we also understand it was to every church, every church that seeks to follow you, every church that wants to be who you want them to be. So Lord, I pray right now that you would soften our hearts, Lord, open our minds, help us to hear and see from your word, not just from me, Lord, but just from your word, the power and truth that is there. And Lord, help us to become more like you as we go through it. In Jesus' name we pray together, amen. All right, let's dig into this now. We're going to start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 12. All right, this is what it says. <clears throat> now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to give recognition to those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. All right, 
Now, I'm going to start blushing as we read this. Right? <laughs> but I want you to see here that as he addresses this church in Thessalonica, remember, they hadn't even been around very long. Uh, he doesn't mention any leadership titles in this passage. He doesn't talk about any particular roles mentioned here. He describes what the leaders within their church were doing. So not just some kind of mantle uh, of title for you are our leader of blah, blah, blah. It was about what they were doing, right? Now, it's startling that this church has leaders at all, right? Uh, in fact, if we, without even thinking about it, as we get to this, chapter 5, it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, there were some leaders already happening in their church. There were some people who had risen in that position of leadership within their church. Uh, and again, not specific positions, but that the idea here is that it certainly does apply to ministry leaders today uh, as an admonition uh, to those who would be leaders and to those who are leaders within our church. Uh, I remember years ago, I had a friend, he was a sharp dude, and uh, back in the day I had uh, an office in my big church building, and on the back of wall of my office I had... Uh, it framed, because I'd worked very hard to earn these things. I have my uh, college degree, right, and my, my major in Christian ministries, my minor in music. <laughs> right there, I have my uh, seminary degree, master's degree, uh, and uh, from the study that I had there, I have my ordination council certificate, meaning there was a church that believed that God had, uh, and agreed with me, that God had called me into ministry, and they blessed me, gathered around me, prayed for me, and commissioned me in this way uh, in an ordination council. I was uh, fortunate to be a part of a, a Pastor Bob's ordination council early on, not too long ago, Bob. And uh, so I had that on there. I had my, my ministry license, a license to ministry. Did you know you can have a license to ministry? I always thought that was kind of funny, in a way. It's like you have a, a double O, what are you, license to minister, right? You know what? I have a license to minister. Well, I got that thing framed. I got it on my wall. So it looked kind of impressive, I guess. I didn't really think about it. I just put it on the wall. I just felt like, you know, I work for it. You know, I might as well display these things, right? So my cousin in my office, at least they can see, I, I, I sort of know something about what I'm talking about. I mean, I don't know much, but at least I know something. And I remember he was sitting there, and he was looking at it, and he just was admiring those things. He's like, yeah, I mean, that's something. That's really something. Because I, I think I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be like that someday. I'm thinking, I'm like, hey, hey, easy, man. I'm like, you know, this is like a flip of the switch. You open your Cracker Jack box and pull something out and say, hey, I'm going to be a pastor today. Or whatever, you know, it's not like that. So I said, well, you will think carefully. And the thing about him is I could just tell. There was something, there was a gleam in his eye. He saw the prestige, which is funny to me today. <laughs> right? The, the, uh, the title of pastor, the title of ministry leader. And so he actually, before long, actually began to pursue that course. Uh, so I tried to encourage him, prayed with him. I wasn't really sure. Well, the truth is, I really think he just wanted that that feeling of being a leader, that feeling of being somebody in ministry, and people are going to look up to him. Boy, I sh he should have talked to me longer uh, if he thought people were just going to look up to him as a pastor. <laughs> it's usually the other way around. But anyway, so he, he started pursuing it. He even started going to seminary. He started going to all that. But let me just tell you, he did not last very long. It became very, very clear that he was kind of looking for the recognition. He was looking for the esteem uh, but he didn't realize what really goes into serving and being a leader within church. So anyway, uh, he didn't last very long. He's a good guy. Uh, I, you know, he's still around doing stuff, but he, he was not in ministry in that way very long. But the truth of the matter is, all of us who are called uh, and are followers of Jesus have a ministry, right? We, we describe church in family terms, not in a ruler and then subjects, right? <laughs> this is, this, you, are, you are not my parish for, in that regard. I'm not some high and lofty dude. I don't have a funny hat. Well, I do have a funny hat, but it's not the pointy one. I, I don't come in, right? It's not, that's not the way this thing <laughs> works. But I love the way he describes the uh, leaders who developed without giving a title of any kind within the church at Thessalonica. And uh, he describes them in three ways. Let's, let's hit them real quickly here. One of those ways, he says uh, in the passage we just read, that they are those who labor among you. They labor among you. Uh, and so the idea here that needs to kind of, kind of come off the page and into our hearts for a minute is to realize that ministry is not a cushy thing. It is hard work. 
There is so much work, so many things that happen. If you follow Jesus and you want to lead and He's called you into leadership, those who serve, friends I've known for years, I have ministry uh, backpack podcast, I called it, for the longest time, and I would interview pastors, and I would talk to them, and I talked about their week, and I talked about how they, uh, you know, what's the thing you've learned, what was something you, you wish you had learned that you didn't know before, and I asked these seven different questions. And there's so many pastors and so many ministers across the land, and I'm just telling you, man, they work very, very hard. The ones who don't are not in ministry very long. So as Paul is describing that, he says, ministry is hard work. It's those who are laboring among you. And this is one of the most frequent words that Paul uses in all of his letters when he's describing ministry of any kind. It's always work. It's always labor. It's always something that is not just easy breezy, but that takes effort and that God blesses it as you go. He used it earlier in this very letter to describe the work among the Thessalonians that he and uh, Silas and Timothy had done among them. In verse 9 of chapter 2, he says, For you remember our labor and hardship, brothers and sisters, working night and day so that we would not burden any of you. We preached the gospel to you. And so there were these guys who would come through and they would demand uh, that, uh, that they would receive all kinds of goods and services and money from the people they served. And then there were those who would come through at different times who definitely uh, needed that, that kind of... Uh, uh, support and they, they deserved it and scripture as we saw uh, in many other places shows that that is a very good and valid thing to support those who teach you right <laughs> the laborer is worthy of his hire but Paul is saying as I'm starting this church as we're getting things going we worked night and day doing other things and preparing to minister and care for you unbelievable but anyhow uh, so in verse 5 of chapter 3, he says it again, for this reason, after they had already gone, for this reason, when I could no longer stand it, I also sent him, meaning Timothy, to find out about your faith, fearing that the tempter had tempted you, and that our labor might be for nothing. Right? So Paul, when he's describing ministry, it's always work, it's always labor, it is something that takes effort, and it is a worthy thing. Then he describes them, not only as those who labor among you, but then he describes them as those who are over you in the Lord. Uh, another translation of that is a cares for you in the Lord. And there's the idea and the implication of shepherding. The idea that there are people who come up into our life as a church body and they become as shepherds. We would call pastors, uh, teachers, those who are in that role. I, I see myself, of course, as pastor of Compass Church in a shepherding role. I'm the, the person who is uh, tuned into a bigger shepherd. But anyhow, uh, the idea is of shepherding. Now, thou, any of you guys shepherds? I mean, like in real life, shepherds? This is a word picture he's using. Anybody? Anybody I have did. sheep? Sheep at home? I, I, I have a teacher. My sheep. <laughs> my, my, my students. <laughs> my sheep. Yeah, my teacher. Yeah. I have to use the hook every once in a while. Now, the Lord is our shepherd, right? Yeah, that's yes. right. Uh, when we look at shepherds and we look at sheep, one of the things I've discovered about, about sheep, and I am no shepherd in the, the literal sense, is that sheep aren't always real bright. <laughs> This is, I guess, an encouragement to the shepherds. It's just a reminder. <laughs> and so when God refers to him as the shepherd and us as the sheep, you don't want to necessarily think of that as necessarily a beautiful thing. I mean, sometimes we're kind of hard-headed. I saw this meme the other day that showed a shepherd, right? And uh, it, was a, it was trying to put together the idea where, where Peter, uh, you know, Jesus gives him the opportunity to kind of make up in a threefold way from when he had denied him three times. And he says, Peter, do you love me? And he asks him three different times. And each time he says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Well, here's this meme, and it's an actual shepherd, and he has this feeding trough. I'm not sure why. Uh, I guess they were just all in the pen or whatever. And uh, I said, so here's Peter. This is what they were trying to say. Anyway, the guy's got the stuff, and he's bringing the thing, and he's about to put it in the trough. And suddenly, out of nowhere, this stupid sheep comes up and bombs it in the back. <laughs> and I show another one, and boom, he's got another one. Another one knocks it completely off his feet. And so, yeah, yeah, that's shepherding. That's, that's shepherding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't tell you, and again, I love all you guys, and I'm having a little fun here today. But I have served in some churches, let me just tell you, where it was kind of like that. Right? Who does shepherd think he is? Who's, I mean, it's like this, the sheep is like, get out of the way. <laughs> Anyhow, all right. So, they care for you is the idea here. <laughs> now, speaking of Peter, Peter described Christian leaders, and specifically those who have that title as well, uh, in the elder role, or the pastor elder role, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1-5, through 5, and it says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, 
as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not out of greed for money, but eagerly. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the same way, you who were younger, be subject to the elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, Jesus himself referred to himself as the good shepherd, and we see it in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, the hired hand. Since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. Then verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. So Jesus paints this very beautiful picture of understanding that he is the ultimate shepherd. And if you ask who the ultimate pastor, the ultimate leader of Compass Church, it's not me, it's, it's ultimately Jesus. He is our shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He is the pastor. All right. So the leaders in Thessalonica, they were described as those who labored among them, and they were those who were over them and caring for them as a shepherd might uh, care for his sheep. And then he described them as those who, in the third description, admonish you. Admonish you. Now, this is an English word that we don't usually use very often that's been translated here from this uh, Greek. Uh, we don't often say, well, yeah, I was really admonished today. I don't, and I, this is not something we use, but the word uh, is used here <laughs> to best uh, try to describe it. Now, here's the thing. Uh, to admonish basically means to caution or to gently reprove somebody. It's basically to give a warning to someone, to someone you care about, someone you love, not in a mean and, and hateful way, but to admonish. So he's describing these leaders in their church in those ways, right? They, uh, they are those who are over you. They are those who labor among you. They are those who, at the, when the time is right, they admonish or warn you to either stop doing something God doesn't want you to do or to start doing something that you haven't been doing and to warn you on the uh, truth and foundation of God's Word uh, to do that. And so uh, I don't know how or why God uses just d dumb old people sometimes to speak through them, but he does. I uh, think about Balaam, right? The, the prophet in the Old Testament. This is so not in my notes, but I'll share it anyway. <laughs> Balaam, right? He was somebody who was going to do something he shouldn't do. He was going to bless the, uh, the enemies of God rather than curse them. And uh, so God causes his donkey to stop on the road. And it makes him so mad. And Balaam gets so angry and he starts trying to beat the donkey. Get up, donkey, what's wrong with you? And then, just matter-of-factly, the scripture tells us that the, the donkey begins to speak to Balaam. <laughs> I can't imagine. Right? And he warns him that if he takes another step, there's an angel with a flaming sword ready to kill him if he makes another step towards this thing he wasn't supposed to do. Well, all I will say <laughs> is that if God can speak through a donkey... <laughs> I guess he can speak for me. Anyhow, so, <laughs> yeah, to warn us, to remind us. All right, okay, back on track here. Here we go. <laughs> so, he describes spiritual leaders of the church in those three ways. Then he tells the church to do three things in regard to those leaders. He says to give recognition to them, right? Recognize that they are your leaders. And then he says to regard them very highly, to give respect to them in that labor that they are doing on your behalf. But then he qualifies all of that and says to regard them in love. Love them, not as your king, not as your president, but as a fellow brother uh, in the Lord. Love them. Now, um, a, a commentator said about this that the words in Greek here carry such an emphasis as cannot well be expressed in English, importing esteem and love to uh, hyperbole. Their love was to be joined with esteem and esteem with love, and both of these to abound and even superabound towards them. And then it says why. Love them, esteem them, respect them, because God is working in their life. And, uh, but why should we do this? And he says so. He says because of their work. 
Because of the work that God has called them to do on your behalf, you should love them, respect them, and give recognition to them. Not because of their title, not because of their great personality, not because they're a really good speaker and they're really good at preaching or whatever, but because of the work that they have done and the role that God has provided for them in ministry. Now, here's a harsh saying that a guy named David Gerzik said uh, about this sort of idea here. He says, if a Christian can't esteem and love their pastor, they should either get on their knees asking the Holy Spirit to change their heart or go somewhere else and put themselves under a pastor they do esteem and love. One way or the other, you have to obey the Scripture in this, okay? So that's what's being said here. So they're to be held in highest regard, it says. Now, I already see the danger, and we've seen the misuse of this on TV and some big old honking churches we've seen where the pastor you know kind of comes in in this highfalutin <laughs> car. He's got an entourage, you know, of people. He stays in the green room or whatever until, right? And, and it's all about you should honor, you respect your pastor. Well, man, let's put this thing in perspective. A guy named Gordon Fee, he has a very uh, a foundational, solid commentary, uh, commentator on uh, 1 Thessalonians. He said this. He said, this does not mean, as has often happened in later times in the church, to exalt them in some way. The leaders are protected from any form of people's fawning over them by the modifier in love, which eliminates that option of thinking more highly of their leaders than they Christianly ought to. The operative phrase in love means to care for them as fellow believers, in this case as brothers in the Lord. No room for titles or fawning here. Love eliminates such ingratiating behavior. And the reason they're told to hold them in such high regard is not because of their position, but because of their work. So, don't fawn over Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but, he's <so> <laughs> but he's so handsome. He's so handsome. <laughs> so then this verse, it ends with a directive, okay? And that leads us into this next little section. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 13, the last phrase, says, Be at peace among yourselves. Be at peace among yourselves. And with this one phrase, they're sold simply to put away all their squabbling and their bickering and their uh, little arguments here and there and, um, and just, just stop that, right? Stop the bickering, stop the, the fighting, stop the quarreling, uh, stop the little conversations in the hallway or at home where you have, you know, roast preacher or roast brother so-and-so and you're talking behind their back all the time. Uh, don't stop the squabbling stop the the fighting stop the the stuff just like that be at peace among yourselves now I remember growing up in uh, no not in growing up when I first started in history I remember churches and I guess when I was growing up too there were a number of churches believe it or not that were actually known for their love no they were known because they fought all the time <laughs> And they would have a business meeting or they'd have some kind of deal. And somebody would stand up and be mad at this person. This person would be mad at that person. And they would have a big argument. I have seen the best and the worst of churches over the years. And in the worst case scenarios is when a fist fight broke out, out in the balcony in the middle of the service. Oh, wow. <laughs> Came from a tough church. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but that's the worst, man. Uh, they completely... <laughs> they completely... Missed the point. 1 Thessalonians 5.13, the last part says, Be at peace among yourselves. When you're fighting, when you're quarreling, when you're bickering, when you're making everything about you more important than the, the good of what God wants to do in a church, you're bickering, you're quarreling, and you need to kind of get yourself and your heart into the right place and be at peace among yourselves. Uh, so those churches that I was referring to, man, oh, they, they should have been at peace among themselves. This idea of being in the same direction. They have a common mission, a common purpose. They're going to strive together and be unified. All right, so this begins what uh, is called the list of exhortations. <laughs> Welcome to the list of exhortations, friends. Here we go. All right, so here's the thing about this. As we move into the next verse, so he does a summary about their people who love you, care about you, they're working hard, respect them, honor them, and be at peace with one another. <coughs> then... <coughs> he goes into these things called exhortations. Now, the idea, again, we've already said admonition and, and admonishing. That's one word we don't regularly use, but it's just the best word to describe the situation. Same thing with exhortation. It's not a word that we really use, but it's a good one in English to describe what's going on. To exhort somebody basically is to tell them what they need to do. 
It's not a rebuking or sharp or critical kind of thing, but there's, and there's no condemnation when someone is exhorting somebody else. And it, but it's also not just a suggestion. It's not just good advice. There's some urgency in the exhortation. There's some urgency wrapped up in the command that is given here. Now, it's kind of like when uh, our kids were little and it was time to go out and uh, we needed a babysitter. Uh, some of you guys remember those days, right? Some of you are in those days. I, I don't know. Yeah, some of you are still in those days. Uh, and you're, you're talking to the babysitter, and it's, as you're going out the door, you remember all those three or four or five very important things you need to make sure they don't forget to do. Right? Be sure. Don't give them peanuts. Be sure. Uh, make sure they're in bed by this time. Be sure uh, that they blah, 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 whatever. And you go through that kind of list of very important things. You kind of hit them, one, two, three, four. These are the most important things I can think of before I leave. I want to make sure you don't forget. That's kind of what happens here. So he's gone through this whole bit, and now Paul, who's pretty much taken the lead on this letter, uh, begins to give them some exhortations, some commands, some short, staccato almost, boom, 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 rapid fire things that he wants them to not forget uh, as he's wrapping up the letter. Now, these are the things I was referring to as relationship gold because they truly are. They were certainly meant to be applied within the context of the community of faith or of the church, but the majority of them, if you apply them, if you obey what he says here, what the Lord is speaking through him, it'll actually strengthen all of your relationships. <coughs> all right, excuse me. Now, it'd be very easy to pass over these, and I'm looking at the time, uh, but we're still going to hit a couple of them. But anyway, it would be very easy to pass over these because they are short and they are direct, in fact, they're the kinds of things you might hear when you first hear them and go, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I got that. What's next? Is there something deeper that I need to dive into here that I need to apply? Yeah, that's simple. I got that. But I want you to ask yourself as you look at these various things, do you really get it? Do you really apply them? Are you making these things a reality in your world? It reminds me of the story of the man in the Old Testament called Naaman. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1, it says this, Naaman, commander of the army for the king of Aram, was a man important to his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was a valiant warrior, but he had a skin disease. So what happens is Naaman ends up going to see the prophet Elisha, and he brings a lot of money and people with him. He has horses and chariots, and they all pull up to Elisha's house. But Elisha doesn't come to meet them. Elisha instead sends a messenger out to this very important man to greet him and tell him what to do. And that story picks up in verse 10 of 2 Kings chapter 5. And it says, Then Elisha sent him a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your skin will be restored, and you will be clean. But Naaman got very angry and left, saying, I was telling myself, he will surely come out, stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the place and cure the skin disease. Art Abana and Far Par the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned and left in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more you should do, or should you do, if it do it when he only tells you to wash and be clean. So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the command of the man of God. Then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy, and he was clean. So he's like, I'm expecting some big thing. I want to hear some big, giant thing I'm supposed to do. What is going on here? Why do you come out here and shake some bells and, and wave his hands on me and, and give me some attention about this thing? No, he just said, go do this. <laughs> go, go, go dip into the dirty old Jordan River. <laughs> but when he did it, he was made clean. When he obeyed, everything changed, right? Simple command, and these final exhortations from Paul and company, or from Paul and company, I should say, to those Thessalonians, he gives very short and simple direct commands, but if the Thessalonians obey them, if they follow them, then they will continue to thrive and be a healthy and strong church. All right, you know what? Let's tackle one of them real fast before we go, real fast. You ready? We're going to tackle just one of these. One of these exhortations, relationship goal. All right, it says this in verse 14, the first part. And we exhort you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle. Warn those who are idle. Now, this is to the ones, he's addressing this basically to the ones who are addressed in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 11 through 12. Oh yeah, we skipped that because we're going to get onto it later. So we're skipping that also. There you go. And so we're going to wrap up there. <laughs> 
We're wrapping up, friends. It's 11 o'clock. <laughs> Gotta leave you hungry. <laughs> and not in the wrong way. All right, so the exhortations that he goes into, no kidding, really. They, they seem simple. They seem, but once you begin to look at them and you begin to apply them and they become a regular part of your life, they are applicable in almost every relationship situation, but definitely within the context of church. But let's bow our heads, close our eyes, let's respond to what we've seen so far in this passage of Scripture. Uh, perhaps you've been, you're here today and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, and I would not be doing my job if I did not share the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is and why we are even talking about relating to one another in these ways. Uh, and that is uh, simply this. You need to know. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means you, that means me. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin, or what we earn from our sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John three sixteen 16 uh, is a mini version of the gospel, and it simply says, For God so loved the world. He didn't leave you in that situation. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Romans 10, 13 makes it very clear today. If you are ready to turn from your sin and trust in this Jesus who paid the ultimate price for you, it's simply this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you can pray with me right now. You can start that journey today. Jesus, today I realize, I confess, I, I'm a sinner, I need you. I'm believing on you right now to save me, Lord. I don't understand everything, but I, I understand today that you died on a cross on my behalf. You conquered death itself by rising from the dead. And now you've made it so that I can be forgiven of all of my sin and have a new life. So Lord, I ask you that. Please forgive me of my sin. Change me. Make me somebody new. And I'm giving my life and my heart to you right now. Help me to follow you with everything that I am from this day forward. I'm trusting you right now to save me. Christ followers, perhaps you can pray with me this. Lord, thank you for all that you have done for me and the grace you've given to me. I pray you would help me to live in such a way that honors you as I go through this week. And I thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen.